a trigger warning disclaimer or a disclaimer of, hey, I am not a doctor. If you use this, this is for informational purposes only. If you choose to use this, then you as the end user are fully responsible. We are not. So talking about tourniquet placement, again, if I have a high volume venous bleed or an arterial bleed, I'm typically going to go straight to the tourniquet. At a minimum, a tourniquet can be used as a stopgap, which goes against the old conventional wisdom, but we did it uh, in combat all the time. You place a stopgap to stop that bleeding so that you can finish whatever it is you're handling and then come back and reassess it and see whether or not that's necessary or not. Uh, so it, when you're talking about combat, whether you're military or law enforcement or someone that's in a gunfight, if you have a gunshot wound, you don't know exactly where it is and you're still actively in that fight, you don't have time to assess where that wound is exactly. You just know it's on the arm or it's on this arm or it's on your thigh, on your leg, what, what have you. So typically what you'll do in kind of the heat of the moment to stop that bleed is go as high as possible, all right? All the way up to the armpit before you put it on, all right? And once you get it in place, you want to get this as tight as possible before you secure it down because you don't want to, you want to take all that slack out of here before you start using the windlass to make it that much tighter because you're trying to compress tissue and push that artery against the bone in most cases, or in some cases a, a vein. You're trying to press that against the bone with that pressure. You know, once that gunfight's over and you're in a safe area, then you can strip these clothes off, cut these clothes off, whatever you have to do, and assess where the actual injury is. For a remote wilderness emergency, which is the context of this video, you probably know exactly where the wound is, so going straight as high as you need to go is not always the best case, right? Your goal with this is to stop the bleeding, and if it's in a remote wilderness scenario where you're not really in danger of taking on more injury, if I know that the injury is right here, then I'm going to go and place my tourniquet two to three fingers above the wound, all right? And the same thing that I'll do if I apply a tourniquet in more of a combat situation up high, if I reassess later that the only wound is down here, then I'm going to move that tourniquet down or I'm going to replace a tourniquet here and take this one off, all right? Because there's no reason to occlude the blood flow way up here if my wound is only down here. In the heat of the moment, you don't know where it is, so you place it as high as you possibly can to make sure you occlude the blood flow to all of the arm. So that's kind of the difference in placement. But if I know exactly where it is and I'm not in danger, then I'm going to go two to three fingers above the wound, take out all that slack, and secure that off without securing the windlass yet. Then from there, I'm going to turn that windlass until the bleeding is stopped and I no longer have a distal pulse, okay? Those two things are the things I'm looking for. The bleeding has stopped here, but there could still be some retracted arteries in here and you, should, you could still be losing some blood here. So you want to make sure that you've occluded that blood flow by checking the distal pulse, all right? At this point, the pulse should be absent. And if that's the case, the bleeding is stopped and there's no distal pulse, then I know that my tourniquet is tight enough, right? If I still have a radial pulse, I may need to give it a turn or two more. But once I get it in, I'll secure this windlass and keep it from loosening by dropping it in this little keeper. With the cat that I'm using right now, you take the rest of that tail, place it inside there, and you can continue that on around. That just secures the tail and keeps it from catching on something and getting pulled out and loosened. With this, it has a tab that you can pull over. And you're gonna annotate the time that you place this tourniquet on there with the marker that you have in there or any other instrument you have that you can write on that. So that is how you apply that. And then again, this intervention needs to stop the flow of blood and the arterial blood supply. So you're gonna check both of those things and you're gonna reassess this every 10 minutes or so until you're confident that this is what or that this is effective in controlling this bleed. Now let's talk about if this is not effective. 
If for some reason this is still bleeding, then you're going to place a second tourniquet higher than the first, but directly next to it. So if this one wasn't effective, I'll place a second tourniquet just above that. In this case, I'll go ahead and use a ratcheting style tourniquet because that's what I have. And it'll show you the difference between the windless style and the ratcheting style. Same thing, place it over the wound. Pull this tight to take out all of that slack as you want. Plenty left over in your ratcheting system to actually apply additional pressure as you're clamping down. So it's important to get these as tight as possible with just the buckles and straps first. And then with this one, it's a simple lifting that actually tightens it. So you'll continue to lift that and it'll click in place and won't let any of that slack back out. Continue until the blood flow stops and you no longer have arterial flow distal to the wound. All right? From there, you can wrap this around and secure it off in this small little keeper here on the back to keep it from getting pulled out. So that's kind of the difference between the ratcheting style and the windless style tourniquets. What to do if one is not effective and tourniquet placement. Again, if unknown injuries exist here, go as high as you possibly can. Place that tourniquet on, stop that blood flow, reassess when it's safe to do so. If this doesn't work here, one more above. A couple points that I wanna make about tourniquet use. You know, the, the old conventional wisdom of these are a last resort is, has been out the window for over a decade. Uh, sometimes this is absolutely necessary and it's absolutely what you need to do. Uh, so if you learn that way in kind of the old conventional wisdom, you know, the, the key point that I want to make is it's, it's more important to stop the bleed and preserve life. And that's always going to be more important than preserving limb. Um, you know, go have a beer with me later with only one arm at the bar rather than bury me with both arms, if that makes sense. Uh, so with that said, when you're placing this tourniquet on somebody, even yourself, it's going to be extremely painful. You're crushing tissue and constricting blood flow. Uh, so, and this is only going to be on for a little bit, so no concern for his, his, his health or safety whatsoever. But I'm going to use the RevMedics, the TX2, on this because it's very easy for me to operate mechanically. Uh, and I'll be able to still check his pulse because he doesn't have an actual active bleed. When this pulse stops is when I'll stop cranking on this tourniquet. And you just enjoy it. React however Sounds you would. Good. I'm going to place this on. I'll put it up nice and high. And get it as tight as possible before I start cranking on this, all right? So I've got all that slack out. Let me find his pulse real quick. You a little nervous? A little bit, <laughs> a little bit. You got a racy pulse. Yeah. There it is, all right? Let's see how many clicks it takes. That's two. So it's gonna be painful because you're crushing those muscles against the bone. I've still got a little bit of a pulse here. Damn it, pulse. Oh. A little bit more. Now, I definitely have slowed the bleeding at this point. Oh. All right, so that's, that's an absent radial pulse right there. All right, so that's about how tight it needs to get. And this is going to be painful. I actually don't know how to take these off. I'm just kidding. <laughs> these are going to be painful. But what you don't want to do is listen to them if you're putting this on another person. Yes, it hurts, but I'm trying to save your life. I'd rather you be in pain than in no pain because you bled out 30 seconds ago. So, not too bad. Yeah. Not too bad, just a pinch and a weird sensation. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to cut this off now. Your arm, not the tourniquet. I got that. Yeah, I didn't need it anyway. Pre-staging tourniquets is a really important step because we're talking about critical blood volume and being able to get this on as fast as possible. So if you're gonna carry it, it's worth staging these so that you're carrying it in the best possible configuration. So no matter what type of bleed you're presented with, you can quickly get it out because you may be applying this to yourself. Some of these will come pre-staged, but some of them won't. So just take them out and take a look at them. What you want is a loop that's large enough to fit completely over your footwear and up over your thigh because that's the largest circumference that you would need to use this on. So have it preset to the largest possible cir circumference that you may need. So to do that with the Cat T and with any of these other tourniquets, what I've found that works the best is to have basically about eight inches pre-staged 
and folded back over on itself. That's about the size loop that will go over my thighs. So if your thigh is larger, then obviously don't have so long of a tail. And then from there, I'll fold the buckle to the top and I'll fold it from the bottom up. And everything just kind of fits just like that. And that's how you stage it in your kit, just like that. So that when you grab it, everything opens up nice and wide. You can put it over your leg if need be. And if the injuries to your arm, it's still wide enough to get over your arm quickly, grab that red tab and then pull all that slack out and then you're ready to go. All right, turn that until the bleeding stops. Right down your time. And you should be able to do it that quickly if it's pre-staged. What you don't wanna do is when your adrenaline's pumping, you've got your fight or flight reflex going your fight or flight response going, I should say. Uh, that's not the time to start messing with this and find that it wasn't properly configured before you ever started. So take a little bit of time, set these up before you place them in your kit and you won't have to worry about it. And again, you know, make sure you practice with these. I have a quick question for you. <laughs> yeah. I feel like this is set up. How do you know you found the right woman? Well, really the way you know you found the right, step one is does she make street tacos? If you make street tacos, then you can look over a lot of other things. But step two is you find the documentary Alone in the Wilderness with Dick Prinicky, and you sit down and you watch that with her. And if she watches it in its entirety and also makes street tacos, then you found a winner. If she falls asleep, it's best to just keep moving. Great advice. You know, be here all day. <laughs>